Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Sarah Eggleston, the Science Officer at PAGES, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first plenary speaker of this meeting, Rashid Chadadi. Rashid is Research Director at CNRS at the University of Montpellier in France. His research topics include paleoecology, paleobiogeography, and quantitative past climate reconstructions from fossil pollen records. He has studied the role of glacial refugia and post-glacial recolonization processes in the distribution of modern plant species and how these past changes may help to manage future threats to plant species. His long-standing collaborations with vegetation modelers and geneticists have led him into the field of protecting endangered mountain tree species in Morocco and Lebanon and prioritizing effective protected areas in the face of ongoing climate change. Today, he will be talking about fossil data collected in Morocco over the past 30 years with a plenary entitled Glacial Refugia and Future Micro Refugia, an effective plan to save plant species. Thank you very much, Rashid. Thank you, Sarah, for uh, this introduction. Um, let me start sharing my screen first. Can you see it, uh, Sarah? Is it okay? Yes, it looks great, Rashid. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, well, um, it is a real uh, and, and great pleasure for me today to give this uh, plenary talk. And as Sarah said, um, I work on other areas um, in in the Mediterranean and elsewhere. But uh, this 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 talk will be dedicated to. Uh, all the paleoecological work that has been done in Morocco and mostly uh, how this work um, was used through time with uh, not only uh, scholars from different universities in Morocco, but also with the uh, stakeholders in, in Morocco, like foresters and so on, to uh, try to make uh, uh, our uh, paleo research useful for managing species. So the, the title of my talk today is uh, glacier refugia and future microfugia as an effective plan to save plant species. Um, as we all uh, know, um, the migration rates of species and the, the uh, ongoing climate change will not be equal for all the organisms. And in this, in this um, plot that I have extracted from the IPCC report 2014, you can see on the left hand, the right hand side, the average climate velocity. And on the left hand side, the maximum speed at which species can move in kilometers per, per decade. So it's, it, it is clear that plants, the, the migration rate, of plants to cope with the velocity of the, the climate change is very weak. And in, in, in such case, whatever the, um, the climate scenario we use, here the, the, the blue one, I don't know if you can see it uh, well, it's the, 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 uh, the Paris Agreement, which is the RCP 2.6. Th this smoothest uh, climate scenario is already um, harsh or too fast for plant species and mostly tree species that you can see here. Not talking about the other climate scenarios between the uh, RCP 4.5 and 8.5 where plant species will be threatened to, to extension. So this first option of species to migrate by themselves with their seeds and colonize new suitable areas seems to be um, not totally or not uh, exactly realistic for all species and mostly uh, mountain tree species. There is another option, which, which broadly speaking uh, integrates um, model simulations to, um, to predict or to um, design uh, suitable habitats for, for, the, for the species, for the survival of species. And using those predictions, one can think of translocating uh, seedlings or seeds to make populations of this threatened species persist. But this uh, option has also many um, 
I would say, side effects in terms of competition with um, species that are already uh, in the, suit the predicted suit suitable habitat and um, species that can become invasive and so on and so forth. So this option can be realistic in some cases, but not for all uh, species. There is a third uh, option, which is which consists of trying to keep populations, few populations of the species in uh, the areas where they are today. Uh, we have to, 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 keep in, to keep in mind that it, it, um, this, this option requires to the conservation or the um, keeping several populations in several areas isolated so that they can um, exchange some genes and therefore not uh, decline genetically. So this, this option has also its, its uh, flaws, but this is the option that I will uh, discuss today. Um, this, this option of looking for a future microfuture for species, species stems from uh, something that we have been studying for uh, several decades now. What we see from the fossil, mostly the, the pollen records, is that the, uh, during the last glacial period, most of the temperate zones in the Northern Hemisphere, and this is valid for uh, Europe, North America, even in Asia, trees were not capable of um, living under the, the, uh, the past, uh, the last glacial climate. So there was a retreat or um, dislocation of the range of these species into these small and scattered fragmented um, areas where they, they persisted during the last glacial period. These glacial refugia had a climate that was more favorable for uh, trees than the global climate. So the, these, these refugia were identified by uh, fossil records um, over the past 40 or 50 years. During the Holocene, what we see is that from these refugia, animals like bears and hedgehogs, but also plants like here, this is the case of the oak and pine, started to migrate from these refugia to colonize Europe. And this is, this is uh, I would say, a pattern that is observed for animals and plants and all kind of species for which the, uh, the temperate zone that we see today in Europe was not um, uh, suitable. So the, the impact of these glacier refugia can be retrieved in, in, in their genome. And for instance, in this uh, study on oak, we can see these colors which show, show us the different haplotypes which, which uh, indicate the, which are the imprints of the isolation in these, the long-term isolation of uh, species in these uh, refugia around the Mediterranean. So this, these glacier refugia helped us to preserve or help the species to be preserved through a long period of hostile climate and then what we see today in, in, in Europe in terms of forests and um, at flat uh, landscapes or in, in, in the mountains come from these refugia. So based on, on this uh, idea of that glacial refugia allowed species to be saved from extinction during the last glacial uh, times, we started, scientists started to think, why not using them, why not using the refugia, this refugia concept to preserve threatened species, that the species that are threatened today and to preserve them uh, in, in, in the future. Let's have a look at the literature over the past decades. The, the, uh, the word glacial refugia starts to appear in the publication, uh, publications about 40 years ago. So we have a record of 40 decades of an increasing uh, interest in, in, in this uh, concept. Over the past 20 years, we started to be more interested in this refugia, in this concept as uh, an option for plant conservation. But the, the, the accuracy of our knowledge 
on uh, refugia is becoming more and more accurate only uh, during the last or the past uh, 10 years where we started to look at refugia at the micro scale with microclimate and we define them with uh, more accurate tools and with more accurate uh, manner. And there we started to, to see more and more publications using the micro refugia concept as a future option for conserving or preserving plant species from, from extension. This concept was initially or among the, the first uh, publications um, designed or published by Valentin Rule in 2009 uh, in, in about uh, vegetation in Latin America. But after this publication, there were so many and we started to look at these micro refugia from a climate point of view, from a topographic or landscape point of view. And we, we also in, in investigated the evolution of species inside these micro refugia. And we ended up with the, um, I would say a more or a clearer idea of how we may use these micro refugia to uh, preserve future, future uh, to preserve species from uh, the ongoing um, climate warming. Um, now, if if we look at the where is the problem, and the problem is happens in in these air in these areas which are hot spots of biodiversity. These these uh, this pub, this uh, plot shows in red the hot spots of biodiversity in the world. This uh, uh, sorry, I did not. Put, put the reference, but this is uh, uh, Myers in 2001 who published this uh, initial paper. Um, so what we can see from this map is that the hotspots of biodiversity where, where we have the highest endemism and the highest diversity, there is also the highest threat to these species. And what is even more interesting is that these hotspots uh, occur in, in areas which are not the richest areas in the world. Uh, when I say rich, it's in terms of resources to manage the, this, uh, uh, this biodiversity uh, issue. And today, as I said, I will talk about Morocco. In Morocco, there are 900, about 900 endemic plant species, which I mean 900 species that occur only in Morocco. And so this is more than the fifth of the total species diversity in, in Morocco, which, which has about 4,200 uh, species. So preserving this, this, uh, this uh, um, uh, tremendous amount of endemic species with which are, which many of them are, are threatened today is, can be a, a daunting uh, task. I have to, to, to stress that Morocco is really doing a great job in this in this context and there are many national parks and several biosphere re reserves and i have been talking with the foresters and they are planning new biosphere reserves to protect and to to try to to save uh, species and some forests from from uh, extension so there is uh, um an ongoing great effort to save plants. But again, saving all of them might be uh, a daunting task. And today I will try to, to show you how we are, what we are trying to do to help uh, forest managers to, to make their, their work more, um, how to say, optimized in, in some way. To, to illustrate this, uh, this approach, uh, I, I, I will show you some data on the Atlas cedar. I have been working on these species for a couple of years now. And the Atlas cedar or Cedars Atlantica in Latin is, is uh, an endangered species according to the red, in the red list of the IUCN and the population trend is decreasing. And I will show you some slides where you can see that just over the past, uh, few decades, the decline is, is very strong. So it is a, a tree that can live for um, several centuries. The last um, 
the last, the oldest uh, cedar tree died in 2016 uh, in the Middle Atlas, and it was about nine nine centuries. Uh, the, the age was about uh, nine centuries. Uh, the Atlas cedar is present in the, in the mountains in Morocco, in the Rif Mountains and the Atlas Mountains, and also in Algeria. Um, the Atlas cedar can stand snow, snowy winters, and it requires, in fact, uh, cold winters for uh, seed, uh, for the germination of uh, its seeds. And it is also uh, a species that can stand harsh climates and sometimes quite harsh. These are the precipitations. Uh, and you can see it can stand uh, almost an, an arid climate with less than 500 millimeters per year. And this picture, I took this picture in, uh, in the, the high atlas, which, um, which are the, the, the last populations, the, the lowest uh, populations in terms of uh, latitude in Morocco that are almost close to the desert. And you can see that the ground is bare and there are no, the, the, the biomass is, is very low. So the, this tree is kind of robust tree and resilient and can stand harsh climate. However, um, the, the, the problem is that harsh climate, when it's, uh, how to say, over a, a short uh, time span, then the Atlas cedar can be resilient and um, re, re spread and, and regenerate. But if the drought is, uh, is, is, uh, is, install, is installed in, in the forest over a, a long period of time, then the damage can be uh, um, strong. Th these, these pictures, I took these pictures in, in 2009. In the eastern uh, most part of the distribution in the Rift Mountains, and at that time, these, the trees were drying. This is not an insect attack, but all the forest was just like this, and there were no insects. Uh, recently, just before the COVID, uh, I went there, and this forest was uh, a ghost forest. So the impact of the drought is very, very, very strong, and populations are really declining in few uh, years. Sorry, I had to. OK. These are these were observations. Now we went to to, to the lab and we took some uh, we we took some course on the field and we did some modeling to try to understand why do we have these this trend and is it recent and how does it go? So we took some corings and we also um, uh, collected some some data from the literature and so on. So this is the, the modern range today, and you can see that these are very uh, tiny spots in the Rift Mountains. This is the northern part of Morocco that you can see here. From, from the, the data that we have collected on the field and for, with other colleagues and, and friends in Morocco and from the literature, we tried to reconstruct the past uh, distribution of the Atlas Cedar during the Holocene. And this is, how to say, a tentative uh, reconstruction where we show that, in fact, the, the Atlas Cedar had a much more extended um, distribution or range than, than today. So we use this, this information and we uh, calibrated uh, a vegetation, a dynamic vegetation model to simulate the tr this, this uh, how to say, the decreasing trend of the Atlas Cedar over the past five decades. So these are the, the transient uh, model simulations that we did between nine, uh, 1960 and 2010. And what you can see, there are also, of course, there are um, several other uh, simulations between these two time slices, but I will show only these two extreme ones. What we can see in these two uh, simulations is um, the striking uh, regression of the, 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 of the range that is uh, here in green. This is in 50 years. So if we look at the data more precisely, we can see that we moved from 40,000 hectares in 1960 60, to 10,000 in 2010. This is 75% uh, decrease. 75% of the total range was blown up in, 
in five uh, decades. Not only the, the range decreased, but also the, the tree line that moved uh, up by more than 200 meters. In, in 1960, we, we found, or the Atlas that was, uh, the tree line was uh, located, situated at, at about 1400 meters above sea level. Now, today, and this is something that you can check if you go to the field, you will not find any um, cedar trees um, below 1600 in the Rift Mountains. So this is, this is a major uh, retreat of, of this beautiful endemic species in Morocco. Um, when we saw that these um, the impact of climate on, on the Rift Man Mountain, and we wanted to contribute to its conservation, then we wanted to make, how to say, a more thorough or more synthetic view of what's going on and try to set up a conservation uh, plan uh, to, to, to save it. So this is basically more or less the, 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 the pollen records that have been studied in Morocco. I know that there are uh, some others, but uh, apologies for my colleagues who that I haven't mentioned here, but more or less what we can see from all these records that cover between 25,000 uh, years and late Holocene, what we see is that, for instance, in the Rift, th this decline started about 2,000 years ago, and now it is more and more um, uh, pr pronounced. In the, in the High Atlas, which is located in, 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 the, in the south of the, the, the range, Atlas that was present there. We can see some occurrences here, but today there are none. The, the first, the picture that I have showed you of the Atlas Tida uh, almost on, on, on sand is, is located in this green spot. So this is the area where we have cedars, but below there are none today. So there is also a major regression um, of the Atlas cedar in the high Atlas. In the middle atlas, so I would say that so far so good. We had a nice uh, populations and there are still today some nice populations that are located in national parks, but we, can, we observe, we can observe also uh, a, de a decline, mostly in this um, site here that has been, uh, that was studied by Henry Lamb, where um, say 20 years ago, the, the lake was surrounded by atlas cedars and today there are none. But we have observed this in many, uh, in many sites. So we use this, this data to try to reconstruct how the Atlas Cedar uh, reacted to the, the climate change over the past 20,000 years. So this is um, the, the time span between 20,000 and the beginning of the Holocene, more or less. This is the early Holocene and this is the late Holocene. So what we can see from, from this reconstruction and the, the, that is based on these fossil records is that uh, when climate was cold, the Atlas Cedar colonized cold areas in, uh, at lower latitudes from almost the sea level to about uh, 1400 meters. And as soon as the climate started to, um, to warm up and moisture uh, is available, Atlas Cedar started to migrate from these warmer areas that are at lower altitudes to higher altitudes. Because as I, as I told you before, uh, Atlas Cedar requires cold winters. So it is at the same time looking for cold winters and more mo moisture at higher mountains. Today, what we see here is uh, about the, the situation of, of today. Today, there are no Atlas Cedars be below 1400 meters and its range extend up to 2,200 meters. So there is, there is a double problem for, for the Atlas Cedar to, to, to persist. The first problem is the migration rate. And with the abrupt or the fast uh, uh, climate change, I don't think that uh, it can migrate by itself to new areas or to upper uh, uh, elevations in, in less than 50 years. And the other problem is that, for instance, in the Rift Mountains, 
the, the highest uh, elevations are about 2,400 2, millimeters. And the species is, all, is already at, at 200 and to, at 2,200 millimeters meters, uh, above sea level. So it is almost at the very top of, of the mountains in the reef. So what I have sh showed you in, in terms of refugia seem to be really the last chance or the last option for the species to persist in this, in this area. So based on this fossil data, we wanted to go a little bit further and make a plan for its conservation. And the plan is we wanted to optimize the chances of this, spe of this species to persist in Morocco based on two, um, two things. The first one is to look for suitable habitats. I was talking about microfugia and then um, evaluate the capacity of the populations that are in these microfugia to persist locally over the long term. And this requires some information about their genetics. Once we have the, the identified more or less the, these microfugia and the, 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 the genetics of, of the species, that the idea is to make a hierarchy of these suitable areas and suitable populations so that managers can uh, optimize their, their, their um, managing plans. In other words, to give a, a, a stronger priority to those populations which have the highest chance to persist. So in the first place, we spend a couple of weeks collecting leaves of Atlas Cedar. And this is my colleague and, and dear friend, Pierre Taberle from the University of Grenoble. Uh, we collected leaves from the Atlas uh, Cedar and to genotype uh, all these populations that you can see here in blue from the Atlas, the high Atlas up to the Rift Mountains. We sampled more than 30 populations. Um, so this is the first idea, is to, to, to genotype the, the species, to try to find out where are the populations that can, that have the highest genetic diversity and therefore to, to have the, the, the highest chances to persist locally. Just, a, just one word about the genetics for those of you who can be interested, and we can talk about that on the chat. Uh, Pierre and, and his team used the uh, skimming as a matter to, um, to collect information from nuclear, mitochondrial, and chloroplastic uh, DNA. And the genetic marker that we have used for the genetic diversity is the allelic richness. And that's the only um, variable that I will show today, not to go into those kind of uh, uh, details. So beside, beside the genetics, we wanted to have some idea uh, on the location of microrefuge. And some colleagues have published some nice papers about the uh, landscape topography as, as um, I would say, a, a variable that can help us find out where these microrefugia uh, can be. So we use the terrain uh, ruggedness to evaluate the, 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 the occurrence of, of these refugia. Ter terrain ruggedness or, or landscape rugosity is, is in fact just the difference between one grid cell, the difference in elevation between one grid cell and the nine surrounding uh, cells. So roughly what we see on this map is, um, is a scale here from uh, red to green. The, the, the more red and the more abrupt or the more rugged is, is the, the terrain. Flat areas are in green and rugged areas are in red. On top of this map, you can see the location of all the populations that we have collected for uh, a DNA. And the blue area here is the... Um, the Atlas Cedar uh, distribution. So if we superpose the, the genetic diversity based on the allelic richness, and the, and the scale is here on the bottom, uh, 
right, we can see roughly that those populations which have the highest genetic diversity, which is in dark blue, are located also in rugged areas. You can see here. And those populations who have the lowest genetic diversity are located in um, flatter or, or less rugged uh, areas. So based on, on the, the landscape uh, rugosity, and the genetic diversity, we tried with many colleagues to build up a conservation index. It is a, a quite simple index, but it integrates these parameters and it, it provides us with a hierarchy. This conservation is, index is based on the genetic diversity of each population, the terrain, uh, the rugosity of the, 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 the area where the, the population is, and it is weighted by a distance between the, the climate, the modern uh, climate envelope of the population and a future scenario. We have published this work uh, last month uh, in March 2022, if you are interested in conservation, in uh, surface science and, and practice. So we use the, these data to build this conservation index. And this conservation index helped us to set up a priority for uh, conservation of the species. Red is, is high priority, uh, orange is medium to high and so on and so forth until green, which is low priority. Please don't, don't get me wrong. This is not uh, an index that says, okay, let's forget that about those uh, populations which, have, uh, which are green. No, this is not the, the goal at all. This is just in, in case of um, we need to manage the resources and optimize the, the, the conservation plans, then we can use this scale to, uh, to choose or to, 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 to put more efforts on conserving those populations which are in red here. So, the populations that deserve or that should be preserved uh, priority are those in the Rift Mountains, which are in red and orange. And indeed, these populations have the highest genetic diversity and therefore they can adapt to, to, to well, they, they are supposedly capable of a certain adaptation or more than the other populations and they are located in, in highly rugged areas. But as I said the, earlier, the problem in the Rift Mountains is that we are um, these populations are almost at the top. So there is an urgent, very urgent need to preserve these micro-refugia with these small populations. But there are also other populations in the Northeast of the Middle Atlas here or in the Middle Atlas here. So the, the, the idea is just to provide the, the managers with, with a tool and we have published this work with, with foresters and they agree and they, they are really, um, uh, how to, to say, uh, they, 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 they like the idea and they want to integrate it into their, 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 their work. So we are really happy to, 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 to set up uh, this tool for trying to preserve the species from, uh, from extinction. I think I am done with my talk. Well, yes, this is the last thing I, I would like to say. Okay, this option of for saving uh, species is, is, could be okay. But many uh, colleagues, um, as, as any uh, option, uh, may have some critics or questions and so on. So yes, microfugia may not be for um, everyone or every species. But this is just, again, let's take it as an additional option in some cases, in some areas, for some countries, some resources and so on. It is not the option for saving all plant uh, species. Before I end up my talk, I would like to say that this is the only work, this is not the only work uh, going on in Morocco in terms of paleoecology and paleoclimate and quater at least, uh, quaternary studies, but there are many other works uh, and many other groups and colleagues. And I would like just to uh, cite few of them like Ilham who, 
or has organized or um, uh, how to say coordinated the organization of, of, uh, of this meeting on an endemic species in the southern part of Morocco. This is this is the Argan tree, but there are also groups in Agadir working on uh, spirithems, uh, Marrakesh, uh, hydrology, and and also um, in in. Uh, Benny Melal, whom the, the president of the university gave us uh, uh, some welcome words. So, yes, there are many um, areas where, where science, uh, uh, paleo science, can be done in Morocco, and you are all welcome to join these groups for uh, any. Um, any other topic like the Morocco is also at the gate of the Sahara and there is also a big issue about the green Sahara and so on. So please um, get in touch with these Moroccan groups and uh, they really deserve and they, they are worth uh, collaboration. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any question, I'm, I'm ready to, to answer. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Rashid, for this very interesting talk. We have gone a little bit over time, so I would suggest that we take the, the question from Ilam that's in the chat, um, and then we should head off to a break before the first uh, e-poster um, talks. Um, so Ilam asks, how do you estimate this retreat in the future? Do you have any idea about the evolution of the cedar in the next, for example, 50 years under the current global changes? Um I don't think that we can talk of a, a linear retreat uh, or exponential. It's, it's it really, um, I would like to talk about the concept of metapopulations. And when we look at um, some populations, it depends on their size and their composition and so on. And sometimes we see, and this is something we saw in Morocco, a population in a very, very good health, which disappeared in less than 15 years. And voices were wondering why. So we, we cannot really predict uh, um, in a linear way uh, how the process will, will, uh, will be. And also climate does not change linearly in, 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 in the Mediterranean. We can have severe drought uh, in, in two or three years in a row and then nothing for five years. If we have that, then if, if we have that kind of alternation, then this kind of trees or species can, can be resilient and re-sprout and regenerate. If not, it will disappear. So there are many variables in the uh, forest dynamics that I, I can't really tell if it will be linear or exponential, but it's, it's fast, it's really fast now. Great, thanks so much. We do have a couple more questions that just came in. Graciela would like to know um, how managers um, may help use uh, sorry, may help the very threatened rift populations if they're at the edge of the altitudinal range, what would be a strategy to preserve those microrefugia? Well, there is a site on the very northwest uh, of, uh, of the rift, it's in Jebel Kelti, which is very steep and, and really to reach the populations there, you have to climb the mountain. And these populations are, are very well saved. What, what I mean is that when you when you uh, uh, how to say uh, not let human uh, humans going into the forest, then that is ninety percent of of the threat that is the, um, the is removed. So what managers can do is to to make these microfuel these small populations as heavens as as uh, uh, areas where that cannot be reached by tourists, uh, locals, no one. It, it, these populations has to be uh, totally uh, preserved from any impact. That would give them a chance to, to persist uh, for a, a longer time period. Thank you, Rasila, for this question, by the way. Great, thanks. And uh, one last question from Mike, who, um, who asks, what are other key components of the Atlas Cedar ecosystem? Are they also under threat? And if so, could they also be conserved along with the efforts to conserve the cedar? Yes, the, the, well, the Atlas Cedar is, is almost a monospecific uh, ecosystem. There are a few oxy cedar and, and oak, and there are some uh, oak species like, uh, well, uh, Petreia, and, um, uh, which, are, which have been also losing uh, parts of the, the range in Morocco. So the, the threat is not on the Atlas Cedar, but on other species. In, 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 the, in, uh, in, in um, 
in the first, if you go to in spring, in this time now today in May, you can see in, in um, under the forest there are uh, beautiful flowers, peonia, uh, which is a, a tiny shrub, which which is also a threatened uh, uh, species to extinction. So if cedar uh, disappears, then a whole many species of that ecosystem will disappear as well. Oh, thanks Thank you, so Mark. much. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Um, this was a wonderful opening to the plenary talks. Um, we will now break until the hour when we will have the first